today's lesson is, I told you last week that one of the things that sparked this class was that JB was teaching me things that I had never heard. You know, I came on Thursday mornings and he would teach this stuff and I'm, I had a billion questions. So every time I had something that I couldn't answer, I'd write it down. And this specifically, you've seen this a million times with him. If you've been at Stillwater Bible for some time, he'll go over the composition of the believer. That's super important for us because when you understand the changes that happen from when you were an unbeliever to when you become a believer, it helps you to be motivated by those truths. Because in a sense, do we want to live like Christians? Yeah. Yeah, we do. Not just in a sense. We do want to live like Christians. Do we always live like Christians? No. We don't. So a lot of uh, denominations will teach that if you don't live it out, you're not saved. Or you may not be saved. Or maybe you lost your salvation. And we're going to see today, based on our identity, who we are in Christ, why that can't be true. And I think that if people look at it from that standpoint, you think, oh yeah, if it's true that I am a new creation in Christ, what happens if I lose my salvation? Wouldn't I have to start all the way back over? And wouldn't that require another payment for the sin that I've already committed? And so you start pulling on that string and the whole system falls apart. But today we're going to see why this matters. Why the composition of who we are as individuals and what our makeup is matters. So think about it as I'm teaching it. And think about specific questions. Two things I want you to keep on the forefront of your mind is what are we made of? Like what are we as, as human beings made of? And number two, the bigger question is why does it matter? Why does it matter that we are new creations? Because God didn't mess up. He on purpose did the things that he did to change us when he changed us. So let's look at it. Today we're going to look at these two source verses. Um, I titled it New Creations, obviously, based on 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, we talked about that last week, what it means to be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation in some translations. The old things passed away, and behold, new things have come. So if you're studying this verse, what are some of the things that, what's one of the questions that pops out? What's the old things and what's the new things? That, to me, that, that Kevin said, what are the old things that passed away and what are the new things that have come? Because if it's true what I told you right before we started, that understanding this so that we'll be motivated and so that we can know, consider, and present ourselves to Christ, uh, then it's important that we understand what things passed away and what new things have come. And look what he says here in Romans 6, 4. And we're going to see the entire chapter of Romans 6 before it's all said and done. But this one applies directly to this lesson. He says, therefore, summary statement, we have been buried with him. Who's him? Christ. Okay. We have been buried with him through baptism into death. What type of baptism is that? Spiritual, spiritual baptism. Spiritual. So what do, what do we mean when we say spiritual baptism? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about water baptism. When we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit seals us into the body. We're baptized into one body is what it says in 1 Corinthians 12. So therefore, we've been buried with Christ through baptism into death. Whose death? Ours. Ours and his. Because what do we say? That when we say the word baptism in the English language, what do we say that is? That we are being buried. Okay. Again. So give me one word. It, we are identifying or we are placed in union so just as Jesus died when we believe we're placed into union so that when he died we died when he was buried we were buried when he rose to a new life we are supposed to rise to a new life so therefore we have been buried with him through baptism to death. So just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Because we're new creatures, we're new creations. We have this new, we're going to say this word, capacity. We have a new ability to walk in the newness of life. But we don't always do it. 
And Paul's whole point here in Romans 6 is you're changed. You're different. You have a new capacity, so do it. <coughs> so this is the practical application. When I say practical application, what I mean is this is the real life <coughs> stuff. Because you are saved, live like it. That's the point of Romans 6. Because we said last week that eternal life is not the it's not the finish line or reward. It's the starting block. So because you have eternal life, because you're saved, live like it. That's Paul's point. Here. Uh, we went over the mission of the series last week, but here let's go specifically to the goals. We want to understand humanity's composition. Not what a psychology book says about it, but what scripture says about it. And we want to understand what the differences are between the composition of believers and the composition of unbelievers because that affects several things. It affects how and what we should it, it affects how we interact with them and what we should do as we interact with them. We want to understand the effects of uh, sin on our composition. That's a big deal. That's very practical because we all sin still, even after we believe. And then we want to understand the implications of our position in Christ. We've already started to talk a little bit about that, but we're going to pull on it a little more. So, let's get into the composition of humanity and sin's corruption. We'll start today with an overview of what literally makes a person a person. Uh, and hasn't always been that way. If not, what changed? Have you ever noticed that the Bible mentions things like a conscience, a soul, a spirit, flesh, all of these words are all throughout Scripture to define parts of the you know, of humanity. But what do they mean? What are they and how can we understand them? And I, I do want to give a quick note or disclaimer. We are conceptualizing these things in a way that fits Scripture. A lot of the reason I wrote this stuff down is because I didn't understand it and I didn't see how it fits Scripture. And it's not that I wanted to back into it so that it would make the things that I was being taught true. I went and studied it, and they are true. So when Paul uses words like spirit, or soul, or flesh, or Peter, or John, whoever's using it, what does he mean by that? And how do we make sense of it in our mind? Uh, so I just wanted to say that, because you're, you're never going to find a place in Scripture that deals with this linearly. There's never a chapter that says, here's what we mean by soul, here's what we mean by spirit, here's what we mean by flesh. But through studying God's word, we can understand it. Okay. Understanding our identity and position in Christ motivates, that's supposed to say us, or our foundation, to living out our roles as a believer and appropriately utilizing our capacities to serve. So let's just start at looking at what humanity was originally composed of, and then what, if anything, has changed. And so we've got this picture of this outline of a person, and that's supposed to be Adam and Eve of creation. So Adam and Eve were created. What do they have? What does God give them? Fall? He, before, so we're talking about before the fall. Oh. So before the fall, when God created Adam, what was he? Dust. He was dust. But out of that dust, he was made into a body. A body. That's number one. Adam and Eve had bodies. That's pretty practical. But true. We are. We, part of what we are, our identity, is a body. What else did he give them? He did. Yeah. He, he did. So when he, when they were created, they were able to relate with God. They had a spirit. We know that from Ephesians 1, just a little spoiler alert, this is going to change. Because of what because of what Scott said, because of the fall, part of us died. Because of Adam's sin. We're going to see from Romans 5, 12, that just as through one man's sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death is spread to all men because all have sinned. So what else did they get? What else did they have? You put a soul in there or would that be after? We do. They had a soul. And a lot of people want to say that these are the same and they are not. And I'll tell you why later in the lesson. What else did they have? Conscience being that? Well, they're, they're going to get They're going to get a conscience. You're jumping the gun. Are body and flesh different? That's a, oh, that's a, that is a great question. 
Are the body and the flesh different? And what I would say to that is it depends on the context from Scripture. A lot of places in Scripture, like, for example, when he says, in the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, that's talking about the life I live in this body. I live by faith in the Son of God. In Philippians, Paul talks about, if I'm going to live on in this flesh, it's going to be for my fruitful service. I'm going to take this body and put it into service for Christ. But a lot of times when we're talking about the flesh, we're talking about the sin nature. And so some people think, well, Adam and Eve wouldn't have sinned if they didn't have a flesh. But that's not true. There's only three there. Uh, I think I have, might have four, but as I'm thinking about it, that can't be true. So for the purpose of this study, we're going to think about def- uh, and define soul, spirit, and flesh this way. And I want you to think about this, okay? Because it's going to come up with some good questions later. The word soul is the word suke. And the root word is P-S-U-C-H-E. Okay, same word we get uh, psychology from. It's the part of us that relates to the world around us. It's your mind, your will, your emotions. It's used 104 times. Every single time, except for a few, it's used for the word soul. Suke is translated soul. Sometimes, somebody said it, it's, tr- it's translated as life. Sometimes it's translated as life. But it's the part of us that relates to our surroundings, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, who you are as an individual. You could say, all right, it's the life force. Suke soul is the life force that animates your body. Okay? The second is spirit. This is the word pneuma. I think I spelled it right. P N E U M A. This is the part of us that is able to relate to God. Okay? Think about that. The spirit, your spirit is the part of you that is able to relate to God. So the famous verse in Ephesians 2, if it says that we enter into this world dead in trespasses and sins. We are, our body is obviously alive because we're in this world. So when it says that we're dead, what part of us is dead? It is. It's your spirit. You are unable to relate to God. Okay? In your natu- in this form, which we're going to get into in just a second. Um, a great example of the use of this word is in 1 Corinthians Paul says a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. The word natural there is suke. He's saying a soulish man, a natural man, because that's what we come into this world with as a soul. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. Okay, that is important. Because a lot of times we want to beat spiritual matters into unbelievers' heads. Okay, the Holy Spirit's job is to convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We give a clear gospel message so that the Holy Spirit can move in them and convict them. And then that person is put to the point of decision about whether or not they're going to believe. These aren't the same thing. If they're the same thing, and if they meant to be the same thing, they'd be called the same thing. And we're going to see a couple of places in the Scripture where he actually talks about the division of them separately. Everybody knows the famous Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is living and active and is sharper than any two-edged sword and pierces as far as the division of both suke and pneuma. Uh, the division of soul and spirit, of your joints and marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of your heart. They're not the same. In 1 Thessalonians 5, as he ends the chapter, he says that you're, he, he prays, Paul will praise that their whole sanctification will be made complete and that their body, soul, and spirit would all be made complete. Three different things. There's no need to list two of them if they're the same thing. Okay? And then here's, here's the big one. Okay? Is the flesh. This is the Greek word sarx. 
SARX. Depending on its use, look at it in its context, but when it's talking about a part of the human composition, it's the part of you, I have it here, it's the internal craving to fulfill self-desire, to fulfill self-desire apart or outside of God's will. Does that make sense? Can everybody relate to that? Is there a part of you that likes sin? Is there a part of you that wants to do what you want even though you know it might be wrong? That's your flesh. That's the part of you that wants what you want apart from what God wants for you. And that is a big deal. And when we say conceptualization, Paul conceptualizes a lot of things by the flesh versus the Holy Spirit. We've got this battle inside of us. Because we're going to see here in a second that believers get the Holy Spirit. Believers get the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, but that flesh doesn't go away. And so there's this battle. There's this pull back and forth between which one we're going to obey. Okay. Any questions about this? I want to make sure we're all on the same page because this is a big deal. We have a body, soul, spirit. Adam and Eve fell. When we say that they fell, what do we mean? They separated themselves from God. So they sinned. Sin. And guess what happened? Now, you know, because of the way that we conceptualize it, the Spirit is the ability to relate with God. It was a little different for them because they literally walked with God. So they probably went back into fellowship. Uh, by the way, you see a lot of times the way that God deals with Adam and Eve and the way that he deals with Cain and Abel even, he wants them to confess. When God, Adam and Eve sinned, what's the first thing they did? They ran and hid. And then like a mighty rush, or not a mighty rush, but a, this powerful wind comes in and it's God. And what does he say? Where are you? Where are you? Did God know where they were? What was he wanting them to do? Stand up. He's wanting them to confess. He's wanting them to say, we blew it. Same thing with, with Cain and Abel. Where's your brother? Did God know where his brother was? He's given Cain an opportunity to confess. <coughs> because if we confess our sins, he's what? Faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins and all <coughs> unrighteousness. He brings us back into fellowship when we confess. So Adam and Eve had the body and soul, but when they ate from the tree, what did they gain? Oh, that's, that's good. So post-fall, so now we can take it to post-creation. And we'll just say after-fall, maybe. I think so. I think that's when the sin nature came. They get their flesh. And somebody said something else. Yeah, Paige said they got a conscience. How, why? why? How did they get a conscience? from the tree that tells them. They, they, they literally ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And by the way, that was what Satan tempted him with. That's how he got them to doubt God's word. If God really loved you, wouldn't he want you to know right from wrong? Wouldn't he, if God really loved you, wouldn't he make that available for you? And they succumb. And for the rest of humanity, for the rest of existence, everything changes. And we're going to see that right now. Let's actually read this real quick because it's important to see from Scripture. If you have your verse sheet, I, I, I printed out verse sheets and you guys don't have to turn back to for in the Bible. Does anybody need more in the Walmart? No. So Genesis 2.15 says, Then the Lord God took the man. Who's that? Adam. The Lord God took Adam and put him where? In the Garden of Eden. Why? to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded Adam, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you will surely die. Did Adam and Eve immediately die? Did God lie then? They did. Well, spiritually they died. Oh, okay, good. So spiritually they died. So... Well, we pause. Push pause on that. What about today? What about when you sin? You die. It's covered. 
separation. Oh, contract crash. Separation. Does that mean you lose your salvation? No. Do you lose your eternal life? No, you're just out of fellowship. Can you serve God or please God outside of fellowship with Him? You can't. You can't. So we see here that they die spiritually, but they also ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, so they got their conscience. Every single person today is born with this exact attribute. Uh, we'll get there in a second, actually. Let's see what... Uh, this is going to come into play later in the series, but let's see what Satan does. Now the serpent, Hayden, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not free eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, Well, from the free fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. What's... Is there anything weird about that? What's weird? He added, she added something. <laughs> Why did she add to it? Maybe Adam conveyed it wrong? Or maybe she just distorted God's word. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw with her eyes, she saw that the tree was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. There's the lust of the eyes. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. There's the pride of life. She took from it its fruit, and she ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened conscience and that they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin covers here's a pattern scripture establishes a pattern right out of the bat in chapter 3 as humans in 2022 we do the exact same thing that Adam and Eve did we see something we want it we take it and then we try to hide it it's the exact same pattern and we all do it. The other pattern that's established here is that Satan is telling you the same lies that he's telling Adam and Eve. Did, did, you, did God really say that? Doesn't he want you to be happy? Doesn't he want you to have all of this stuff? If he did, then he's loving God. And if he doesn't, he's not. And so often today, Satan's game is to make us doubt God's word and to make us doubt his love. It's the exact same. It's the heart of the issue right here in Genesis 3. It's going to come into play later in the lesson. So you know the answer to this, but what did man receive after eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Say it. Conscience. Adam and Eve gained a conscience. But what was God's warning concerning the tree or of the knowledge of good and evil? Eat and you will die. Eat and you will die. And I don't know Hebrew, but the way that I was taught this is that dying, you will surely die. So dying spiritually, you will surely die physically. So one and two, spiritually and physically. Death is what? What's another word for death in Scripture? Separation. Separation. You can be separated in your fellowship but for unbelievers, they're going to be separated in their relationship forever because they haven't believed. We know this from Scripture that Adam lived for 930 years. He didn't immediately die physically, though he would later as a result of sin, but he did die spiritually. And just to recap that point from last week, death is always a result of sin. Death is always a result of sin. It may not be physical death, though it could be, but it is at least always separation out of fellowship. We know from Romans 6.23 we saw last week, the wages of sin or the result of sin is death. 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And in Romans 5.12, dealing with the imputation, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death because of that sin, now death is spread to all men because all have sinned. So death is separation from God. <coughs> so because of sin, Adam and Eve died spiritually and they would eventually die physically. From this point on, mankind would be born spiritually dead and separated from God, leaving every person as they enter existence with what? Yeah, we all have a conscience now. What else do we have? <coughs> Sin nature. Yep, flesh. Body. Yep, we saw the body. Soul. Yep, we still have a soul. Okay. Every single person in this room, this was your identity. This is what you were when you were born into this world. You were born into this world with a body. You had a soul. You had a conscience. And you definitely had a natural pull to sin or a desire to do what you want apart from what God wanted for you. A natural man, a soulish man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. He wants to sin. He doesn't have a result. We're going to see later in this study in a little bit today that in Romans 6, these people have the bonds of the flesh. They're literally chained up to it. They don't have an option. There's no other way for them. And why would there be? They're living life for themselves. There's nothing else for them. And Paul conceptualizes that as the bonds of the flesh. Okay? So a body, a soul, a flesh, and a conscience. Okay. The composition of a new creation and a new union in Christ. That's all bad news. But there's good news. Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ for eternal life is gifted that life. And we also get these things. We're made spiritually alive. What does that mean? No longer separated from God. Yeah, no longer separated in any sense. Because your relationship to God begins in that moment. You are able to relate to Him because you are at that moment a child of God. But as many as received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. So anybody who now puts their faith in Christ becomes a child of God, and that relationship can never change. Moms, can your kids ever not be your kids? They can't. No matter what happens, those children came from you. They are yours. Now, can something happen in your life to break fellowship, to where maybe you don't talk anymore, or that you're separated? Can that happen? That can happen. There's just broken fellowship. The relationship stays the same, but the fellowship may be broken. That is the picture here. By faith in Christ, you are a child of God, and that relationship exists forever. It can't change. You can break fellowship, but you're never going to stop being a child. Okay? You're made spiritually alive. What's the implications of that? When you were given, when you were made spiritually alive, how does that even? Why does that even matter? How does that benefit you? How does it benefit? How do we define it? Well, how do we define a spirit? You can relate to God. Because... That's a big one. <laughs> you can now relate to God. Uh, you can have, you can enjoy, you can draw close to Him. You can enjoy close fellowship. You can be in union. You couldn't before. That's a big deal to be made spiritually alive. What else do we get? Look at this number two. We're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Isn't that the same thing? Isn't being indwelled by the Holy Spirit the same thing as being made spiritually alive? It's not. Why not? A lot of people in the Old Testament may not have had the Holy Spirit, at least not all the time, but they still had the relationship. Okay, that's true. You literally have God living in you. And you're not God. 
Do you have like your not? Yeah. So if you say that being made spiritually alive is the same as having the Holy Spirit, you're saying that you're God. Because there's a part of you that is awakened or created, whichever word you want to say, you become spiritually alive. That is not the Holy Spirit. That is your human spirit that is made alive. But also, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. Who is the Holy Spirit? Spirit of God. It's God. It's as much God as God the Father is God, and as much God as Jesus Christ the Son is God. The Holy Spirit doesn't get a lot of uh, appropriate attention. It gets a lot of inappropriate attention, but it doesn't get a lot of appropriate attention because that's how he wants it. His whole role is to be in the background convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to promote Jesus Christ. But it's cool that you literally get God living in you. And there's a lot of benefit. How does that benefit you? How does it benefit you to have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You understand the Bible. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. So, is it true? Does, does the Holy Spirit help enlighten Scripture? Every single time I teach, I pray that He will. Because the Bible says He does. Uh, Jesus, when he, right before He leaves, He says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, who my Father will send, He'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've taught you. That's cool. Because the same thing for us. When you put the Word of God in your heart and in your mind and you're out living your life and you're talking with people, the Holy Spirit's going to bring the, His Word to your mind so that you can talk to people about it. That's a benefit, not just for you, but for His kingdom. What else? Is there anything else cool about that? Let me, let me show you something. Open, open up. I didn't put this in here, but I want to read it. Go to 2 Timothy 2. Look at verse 10. So it's kind of a summary here. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen or believers, so that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. And then here, look at this, in verse 11. It's a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, did we die with him? Yes. How do you know that? Said right here. Yeah, well, not just here, but also <laughs> what we just studied. Yeah. That's what it means to identify with Christ and to be in union with him. If we died with him, and we did, we will also live with him. Uh, chapter 2, verse 11. Verse 12. <clears throat> if we endure, we will also reign with him. What does that mean? Both were as well as I think it's about rewards. It, the reigning is a reward. This is an if-then statement. If you live out your faith, if you live like you're supposed to, because that's what this is, it's our identity, we've been given all this stuff, now we're supposed to go live like it, there's going to be a reward for it. But if we don't, if we deny him, he's going to deny us rewards. But then look at this, this is the point, verse 13. If we are faithless, and we are, he remains faithful. Why? Not deny himself. He can't deny himself. When you put your faith in Christ, you are sealed into the body by who? Holy the Holy Spirit. And you are given the Holy Spirit as a pledge of your inheritance. You get the down payment of the Holy Spirit for what the riches are to come. That's really cool that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. <clears throat> because he, can't, he won't ever deny Himself. That's part of what it means to be in Christ. Which is the next thing. We're placed into the body of Christ, or the other word for that is what? What is the body of Christ called? Church. It's the church. It's the entire group of believers. The Old Testament knew that the church was kind of hidden there. They did it. If you were to ask Daniel, because Daniel gave all the prophecies about the future, and you say, hey, what about the church? What would Daniel have said? What's a church? They didn't know. 
They didn't know that that was going to happen. They thought that the Messiah was going to come, do his thing, and immediately they would start the eternal state or the kingdom. And that's not what happened. We're still in the church age. We're placed into this body for a purpose, by the way, which we're going to talk about later in the series. And then here's the last thing. Not the last thing, but the last thing that we're going to talk about in terms of our identity. We're given spiritual gifts. This is weird because it's supernatural. It's not natural. It's not part of what we come into this world with. But we're going to see here in just a second that we get the Holy Spirit and part of what we get there is a gift, at least one from the Holy Spirit. Um, spiritual gifts are a big deal. We're not going to talk a lot about it today because we will later. Uh, but they're also one of the most misunderstood things in Scripture. When you, especially in charismatic circles, when we talk about a spiritual gift, what's the one thing everybody wants to talk about? Speaking in tongues. They want to talk about speaking in tongues. Paul goes to great lengths in chapter 13 to say, that ain't it. You guys all want to do this, but if you don't have love, none of, none of your gifts matter. And he says that every single person gets a gift and they're all important. We're going to see why later. But the truth here that I want to establish right now for you is that if you've put your faith in Jesus, you have at least one gift. Who is that gift for? Is it for you and your self-edification? Who's it for you? What is it? The body. It's for the body. Your gift is to serve. Galatians 5.13 You're called to freedom. You can do what you want. Just don't let your freedom turn into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. In uh, 1 Peter 4, he says, As good stewards of the manifold grace of God, use your gift. Be a good steward with it. He didn't give it to you so that you could sit on it, which is going to play into the parable of the talents and minas, where we see the wicked and lazy slave sit on his talent. <clears throat> but I don't want to get into all that today. We'll get into it later. We're made spiritually alive and given the Holy Spirit to indwell us. So I put 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20 because that's a famous verse. That's the one where Paul says, Do you not know that your body... As part of who you are, is a temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you that you have from God and that you're not your own because you've been bought with a price? And it has that verse in. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The Holy Spirit is in you so that you can glorify God in your body. Not so that you can promote yourself, not so that you can use your body to chase your own self interest but so that you can put it into service for Christ and service for God. I want to read through these passages really quickly. So this is Ephesians 2, start of the chapter. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly... He's writing to believers. He's writing to the church at Ephesus. You were dead, which you formerly walked according to the course of this... What? Okay. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? Okay. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in what? The lust of our flesh. Paul is laying in it. He is uh, laying the groundwork and an outline for the enemies to our identity. From the enemies that we have to face every single day. We have to face a fallen world system, which Satan controls, by the way. And there's a part of us that wants to do it. There's part of us that wants to engage in it. So Paul is starting this identity conversation by saying, you too used to you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, too, we all lived in the indulging in our own flesh, in the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together. Which part of you was made alive? 
your, well, it's your human spirit. You were made alive together. For by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. Earlier in the book, he says, in him, who's this? Who's him? Christ. It's Jesus. You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, which we covered last week, so after you listen to the gospel, having also what? Believe. Believed. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. We're given a down payment with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. That's us. We are a people for his own possession to the praise of his glory. So the point is here that believers are made spiritually alive and we're given the Holy Spirit. So let's see it. For believers, once you put your faith in Christ, what changes? Okay. New things have come. What else? Human spirit. But wait, that's only half. I thought the old things passed away. Isn't it true that we still have a flesh? Is it, by the way, is it true? Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure. So, we have a flesh, but the old things passed away. What, what, what passed away? The desires are still there. Your old identity, your world. You're not tied to it. That the chains of the flesh are broken. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe you have no other choice. Okay, thank you, Ernie. Part of your old identity <coughs> is you didn't have a choice. You didn't have a, you were spiritually dead. You were a soulish or a natural man, but now you are a spiritual person. And the chains of the flesh are broken. Even though the flesh exists, you don't have to, you do not have to succumb to it. You're going to see later in the rest of chapter 6, starting with verse 11, he's going to say, so stop it. You feel like you don't have a choice, but you do. You feel like the pull's too great, but it's not. My grace is sufficient for you, is what he says. You don't have to sin anymore, but there's still this battle here and here. And so we're going to see later that in Galatians he says, Walk by the Spirit so that you don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. You have a choice. So stop considering the members of your body or stop presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness because you are not unrighteous. But present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to Him. Remember last week we talked about the $5 theological word justification? That means to be declared righteous. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You are a righteous person. So live like it. That's his point here. Yeah, the flesh still exists, and there's a battle there. There is. But you don't have to, you don't have to succumb to it. We still have a body. We still have a soul. The part of us that relates to the world around us. And we still have So as we talk about identity, who you are as a believer, this is it. Now, I'm not saying it's all-inclusive, but this is a great start. You have a body. You have a soul. You can tell right from wrong. You have a natural disposition to sin. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and you're able to relate with God because you were made alive in Christ. This is who you are. There's lots of implications here, especially this one. There's also places that talk about how people can sear this. And you can sear your conscience to where it doesn't bother you. There's a lot of questions in there too. Some of them I can answer and some of them I can't. But we can go to different places in Scripture and see these truths. Okay. So we have a body that encapsulates our soul, spirit, flesh, conscience, and the Holy Spirit. 
Once we believe, we have that capacity or the ability to walk in a new way. And we are actually called to walk in a new way. That's difficult. Because by grace you're saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift. Your eternal life has nothing to do with your works. Yet you are called to live it out. If you don't, it doesn't mean that you're not saved. It means that you are just simply obeying this instead of this. How many of us, if we shot a truth serum in our arm, would say that we always look like this? Probably nobody. A lot of times we look like this because we ignore these. We aren't good stewards with the manifold grace of God. We don't, we don't, we obey this and we ignore this. So what do you think the Holy Spirit goes when you sin? I still think you're going to go by the So whenever he says he gives you over to a, a depraved mind. A depraved mind. A depraved mind. Does that mean that, uh, so for those So no longer the Holy Spirit not, does that help you? Uh, I, I think you're talking about Romans 1, right? Yeah. I don't. I think Romans 1 is dealing with this, not this. Oh. Yeah. So, once we believe... Oh, by the way, that's a good question. Any other question? This is difficult because it's not taught very often. And there's a lot of questions that come along with it. But all this is in Scripture. <coughs> You're going to see all over the place. And later, we're going to do a whole series of lessons in this series on our enemies. On the world, the flesh, and the devil. And there's a reason. It's because we're supposed to stand firm. We're supposed to live a life that's pleasing to God. But if we're constantly succumbing to these three enemies, and we're unable to stand firm and to resist their schemes, including the ones we set up for ourselves then we're going to fail. Okay. So here we go. Once we believe we have the capacity or the ability to walk in a new way, we're called to walk in a new way. That way is the newness of life. Just as Jesus died and rose again to a new life, when we believe we are identified with him and we identify with his death, burial, and resurrection, we are raised to walk in a new life. We're supposed to use these. But a lot of times we don't. Look what he says here in Romans 3, uh, six, chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. What is that? What is the old self that was crucified with him? Our desire of our flesh. It's the flesh. 100%. The problem is, is that even though he crucified it, we still will put ourselves back under its bondage. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves or chained to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. The problem is, is that a lot of times we make ourselves slaves back to it. Because we don't know, consider, and present ourselves to God as new creations. Now, if we've died with Christ, and we have, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. You believe that? Will, will, any, will Christ ever die again? No. Why is he called the first fruits of the day? First 
person to be resurrected and to never die again. There's been people who were resurrected or even resuscitated, but they all died again. Jesus is the first fruits of the dead because he conquered death, and he'll never die again. That's why we get life through him. Having been raised from the dead, he's never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And we're supposed to be the same way. Being conformed to his image, we're supposed to live our lives for God. <clears throat> and to present ourselves to God. As in, and, and our members as instruments of righteousness. So 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away, but old new things have come. Okay, we're going to get done early, uh, but I did all of these as blanks because I want you to walk through this with me mentally. Okay, these are in order. What entered the world through Adam? Sin. Okay, sin. Does anybody have a verse for that? Uh, we just read one yeah, Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12. <coughs> And we know that sin brings what? Sin brought death. Same verse, but you could also use Romans 6.23 as well. Man's spirit died and led to eventual physical death because of sin. Okay, so number one is that sin entered the world through Adam. Number two is that sin brought death and separation. Number three. Adam and Eve ate from the tree, giving humanity the knowledge of good and evil. That is what? What's the knowledge of good and evil that's in each one of us? It's the conscience. Number four. Now, when a person comes into the world, not a believer, but an unbeliever, because obviously everybody who comes into the world is an unbeliever, when a person comes into the world, they have a body. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Okay. They have a soul. Suke. They they're, they're a natural man, a natural soulish man. They have a conscience. And just like us, they still have this natural bent to sin or this desire to sin or this part of them that wants to get what they want without regard of what God wants for them or without regard to what God wants for them. So they have a body, soul, conscience, and flesh, but they're what? But they're spiritually dead. What is the application there? Say again. Believes the Holy Spirit That's, is dead. Okay. No, no. How are they going to believe? Hearing. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So what's our job? To spread the word. Just like I think in your Ephesians 1 verse, didn't he start it by saying, after hearing and then believing, you were sealed. That means that when you leave the walls of this church and you go to your job or you go into your home maybe or you go wherever, there are dead people walking everywhere. There are people that are spiritually dead and bound for the lake of fire. And if we care about that, then we need to give the gospel message out as effectively as we can, which is why we started with that last week. It wasn't just the foundation for our identity. It's the foundation for all of the identities of all of the people in the world that we're supposed to be reaching out to. They're spiritually dead. When a person believes in Jesus Christ for eternal life or a Savior, they are made spiritually alive. They're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. They're placed 
or sealed into the body of Christ, which is the church. We're going to see it towards the end of this series. But being in the body of Christ isn't just a picture of the church. He actually uses Christ as the head, and we're the members of the body, because we all have a role to play within that body. And just like your bodies, if something is absent, disjointed, broken, fractured, strained, whatever, the body suffers. And so there's a picture there that we're going to draw from. And then the last thing is that we receive spiritual gifts. These are all part of your identity. You now are made spiritually alive. You now have the Holy Spirit in you. You are now placed into a body, the church, and you also have a supernatural ability. <coughs> At least one. That's a fun lesson. I can't wait to get to it. Number six, we are to understand, and I chose that word carefully. I, want, I originally had the word know there. I don't just want to know it, like just something that we can rattle up. I want us to understand its elements. We are to understand that believers are new creations. I don't want you to leave this class and just say, oh yeah, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. That's knowing it. What I want you to do is understand it so well that you apply it, so that it bothers you if you're outside of fellowship so that it bothers you when you're presenting your members to unrighteousness instead of righteousness. I want, to understand, I want you to understand that believers are new creations and we're supposed to live like it. We identify with Jesus Christ's death and resurrection because just as He died and rose to a new life, when you believed, you died and rose to a new life. Sometimes we just don't live like it. We identify with Jesus Christ's death and resurrection with the capacity or the ability now to walk in the newness of life. I don't know if that's convicting to you, but this was convicting to me when I studied it. And it's still convicting today. And I went from this point where I was like, I was, an, I was, I was a believer, but not very many people would have said that I lived like it or acted like it. Sometimes even today people would say the same thing. But it bothers me. I want to live out what is inside of me. I want my identity to match. I, or not my identity. I want my lifestyle to match my identity. That's integrity. When your action meets your words. I want my life to look like I'm a new creature. Like I'm supposed to walk in the newness of life. So number one, quick, easy applications. Understand that as a believer... You identify with Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. If you don't know that or understand that, it won't bother you when you don't live like it. And I think that's most of Christianity today. Number two, walk in the newness of life. This is the application of it. Walk in the newness of life. Utilize your ability to stop sinning. We're going to see later in Romans 6, 7, and 8, the chains of the flesh are broken. Paul says, oh, what a wretched man that I am. Because the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do, I don't want to do. What a wretched man that I am. We can all identify with that. But there's a growth and a maturation process that we're all in, or should be in and going through. We want to be more and more conformed to the image of Christ. There's another, there's another side to that point that we can identify with. Christ was a man. He was human. And he was tempted many times over. Yeah. And succeeded. Yeah. It's a good point. He was tempted in all things, yet without sin. Number three, view our call to walk in the newness of life as more than a recommendation, but as an expectation. This is a big deal. Because a lot of times we say, I've got eternal life. I'm not worried about any of the other stuff. I can go do what I want. If that's true, then Paul wasted at least, I don't know, 90% of what he wrote. Most of the New Testament isn't about how you gain eternal life. It's about what you do with once you have it. God has an expectation. We're going to see later, uh, I think in lesson four, three or four, maybe next week, I don't remember. But we're going to look at Romans 12 where he says, I beg you, I urge you, 
by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Just like we talked about tonight, you have the Holy Spirit so that you can put it into service for Him. Paul begs you. He doesn't say you will. He does say, it's, I'm asking you to do this. He wouldn't ask us to do that if it weren't an option. But the fact of the matter is, is a lot of Christians choose not to. They choose to walk by the flesh rather than by the Holy Spirit.